um, which is which is why it's um, so important, particularly for white people who are raised in the U.S., um, because we are acculturated in white supremacy. Um, as you know, this country was founded on some great ideals like life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness and liberty and justice for all. Um, it was also founded um, by stealing land and um, committing genocide against the indigenous peoples, as well as kidnapping and enslaving African peoples for free labor. Um, and which really was uh, the precursor for becoming a, a racialized society and inventing race and the caste system of race um, to justify um, those atrocities. And so um, from there grew our white supremacy culture in a nutshell. Um, and so I'm, uh, I'm always excited when we are talking about um, how the history of white supremacy and how it manifests today. We like to think that things like that are in the past, but we know um, until we actually reconcile our history in US that, that it will continue to uh, come in, up right in our faces. So, and I'm really excited. I have uh, two great speakers. We have two great speakers here tonight. Um, uh, professor Elizabeth uh, Liz Gavard is a sociology professor at Tarrant County College, and her research explores spirituality, religiousness, and how they affect moral orientations, um, and her professional services center on justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. Um, she's a member of Pathways and lives in Keller with her family. And my friend Michael Phillips, who is a uh, the author of White Metropolis, Race, Ethnicity, and Religion in Dallas, 1841 to 2001. Um, he's a scholar of American race relations and a, um, a very sought after speaker um, <laughs> about Texas history, white ring politics, um, and apocalyptic religions. He's also a native Texan, has been in, lived in this area um, and received a journalism degree from the University of Texas at Arlington. Um, in 1983 and was a journalist for a time in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Um, he earned a master's degree in history from the University of California and his PhD at the University of Texas. White Metropolis was his uh, PhD dissertation and he was uh, awarded the Outstanding Dissertation Award and was ultimately published as White Metropolis. And so with that, I'm gonna invite Liz to um, start with her presentation. The format will be, um, Liz is gonna present for about 20 minutes and Michael's gonna present for about 20 minutes. And then we'll have about 35 minutes for uh, discussion and questions. Okay, sound good? All right, Liz, please take it Thank away. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Oh, my computer's being slow. <laughs> are y'all seeing the PowerPoint like I hope you are? <laughs> okay, my, my talk is titled White Privilege, Everything You Ever Wanted to Know But Were Afraid to Ask. Uh, but realistically, because this is a gathering of UU people, <laughs> I assume that probably everyone in this group already knows that white privilege exists. I probably don't need to convince you of that hopefully. Um, but what I want to do today is model for you how I talk to everyone about white privilege. I've taught this to probably thousands of students at this point. Um, in my in career, I've always taught in North Texas. So I always have students in my classes who are, you know, very conservative Trump supporters who believe that race doesn't exist. <laughs> But I'm able to talk to them about white privilege in a way that so far, fingers crossed, no student has ever gotten mad at me. Everyone accepts it. So I'm showing you how I talk about white privilege. If you already know that white privilege exists, which I'm assuming probably everyone here does, then hopefully this can be a great model for you about how to talk to other people who may not believe in that. Um, and maybe you'll learn a little bit along the way as well. Um, so hopefully this is helpful for everybody. Okay, let's start out by acknowledging the fact that privilege is a really scary topic for people to talk about. I've got a picture here of Nosferatu, ooh, horror movie, scary. 
um, every time I ever ask my students, how many of you have heard arguments, screaming matches, people yelling at each other on the internet or in real, real life um, about privilege, usually at least 90% of the class raises their hand. So then I say, it's okay, we're going to talk about it in a way that is calm and reasonable and will be okay. Uh, so do acknowledge at the beginning that privilege is a really scary thing for people. So let's start off just by asking the question, what is privilege? Privilege is, and I'm going to read you the dictionary definition here, it's a special right, advantage, or immunity granted or available only to a particular person or group. But I do want to note that privilege comes in two main forms. The first is earned privilege, like this pilot here on the screen. The pilot has earned the right to fly a plane through training and skills. Y'all, if I try to fly your plane, you should get out of that plane quickly. You know why? Because I don't have a pilot's license. I have not earned the privilege to be able to fly a plane, and you shouldn't let me. <laughs> Earned privilege is usually not controversial. That's not the thing that people are yelling at each other about over Thanksgiving dinner. The other kind of privilege is unearned privilege. Unearned privileges are the types of privileges that you're just born with. You didn't do anything to get that privilege. You're just born in a body, in a society, and society grants you rights, advantages, or immunities. So I like using a different definition. This is my own homemade definition. Privilege is the ways you were born lucky. It's like life is this giant slot machine and some people are born lucky and other people are born unlucky. I do wanna point out here that if you're a spiritual person or a religious person, if you believe in some kind of higher power creator God, maybe instead, whenever I say it's ways you're born lucky, you might interpret it as ways you're born blessed. Either of those works just fine. You can think of it either way. But either way, you didn't choose your body and you didn't choose your life. And you just grew up in this system that either gives you advantages or oppressions. So either lucky or blessed. I like this slide because it shows lots of different kinds of privilege. Whenever I'm talking to students about privilege, I don't wanna jump right into talking about white privilege. That's a recipe for disaster. Instead, we start with the basic groundwork of what privilege is in general. So you look at this slide, let's stop at like the 12 o'clock position if this were a clock. What about education? Your education is an earned privilege if you got any education, but your parents' education is totally unearned. You didn't choose your parents and you didn't choose how educated they would be. So if you're thinking about what is the luckiest position to be born in with parents who have high education or parents who have low education? Obviously, the luckiest position in society is parents with high education. What about sexuality? What's the luckiest position to be born gay or straight? Straight is the luckiest in society because gay people have a lot of obstacles. Ability, here we're looking at people who have disabilities versus people who don't have disabilities. Being born without disabilities is the luckier position. That's the privileged position. The privilege of age changes really depending on what you're talking about. If you're looking for a job, being 80 years old probably isn't going to help you. But if, for example, in your church, if your church values the wisdom of age, then they might privilege you because you're older. Gender. Is it easier to go through life if you're born transgender or if you're born male or female, right? Um, man or woman. Uh, cisgender is actually the term for that, but I don't always assume that everyone knows the term cisgender. Is it easier to be born transgender or cisgender? And the answer is cisgender. Um, ethnicity, I kind of lump in with race, so I'm going to skip that. What about culture? Do you have an easier life if you're born in the United States or if you're born in South Sudan in the middle of a civil war? Obviously in the United States. So when you're comparing those two lives, being born in the US is the privileged position. Language, here in the United States, being born into a family that teaches you English as your native language, that is the privileged position. Class is very easy. Everyone knows that your life is easier if you're upper class than if you're poor. And then race. White is the privileged position here in the United States. 
Of course, different countries have different racial systems, different conceptions of race to begin with. So this isn't necessarily true everywhere. But here in the United States, it's obvious that white is the privileged position. Almost all but one of our presidents have been white. Most CEOs are white. Most millionaires are white. Most billionaires are white. Most people in the upper classes are white. Uh, most people who get PhDs are white. Most pastors at churches are white. Most preachers are white. Uh, sorry, same thing. Most principals at schools are white, right? So if you look at all the different positions in society where people have money or power or status, the vast majority of those positions in society have a lot more white people in them than they should given white people's uh, population in general in the United States. So once we've established the concept of privilege and we talk about privilege as this huge matrix of lots of different characteristics, it's not just about your race. It's about everything about your life. It's a lot easier to draw students in and hopefully people that you would talk to because hardly anyone will argue the point that, for example, you're luckier if you're born wealthy or you're luckier if you're born without a disability. Everyone gets that. So once we've established the fact that some people are born luckier than others, then it's very easy to go on and talk about race. Now, I do want to just take a time out here to note the fact that I'm speaking about the privileged position being the position that can most easily lead to success. But everyone's definition of success is obviously different. Uh, one of my grandmas always said that she wanted to be poor so that she could appreciate what she had. She's a perfect example of someone who has a completely different definition of success than a lot of people in the world. Honestly, all honesty here, I think my successful life might be one where I eat the most barbacoa tacos. I think those are delicious. I love them. <laughs> So yes, everyone's definition of success is different, but I made this slide just by Googling successful people and putting all the images that popped up on the slide. And you can see how most people interpret success. Most people interpret success as lots of money or lots of trophies or admiration from other people. Maybe you're a celebrity. Uh, maybe you're somebody who has a lot of power and influence. You can see a picture of Einstein on the right. Maybe you're somebody who revolutionizes ideas. These are the ways that society talks about success. So when we're talking about the privileged positions, we're asking what position could you be born in that would make you most likely to fulfill society's ideas of success? So here I wanna point out that everyone has some privileges and some disadvantages. It would be a very odd person if you were born with all disadvantages. I'm not saying that it's impossible. Anything humans can do, somebody somewhere is doing right now. That's a good general rule of thumb. But it would be very unusual to be born, for example, to homeless parents who didn't speak English, who were also immigrants, and you also have a disability, and oh, by the way, you're also gay, and you're also transgender, and you also have a low IQ, and, 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 and. Most people don't have that many disadvantages. On the other hand, you're a pretty unusual person. You're a rare person if you're born white to well-educated parents who are also rich and you also don't have a single disability. And also, and also, although notice that I'm pretty much describing politicians in the US. <laughs> so there definitely are people who were born that way, but we can easily see that success is easier for them. Most of us, normal people, not politicians, not millionaires, most of us, have a mix of advantages and disadvantages. We have some privileges and we're missing some privileges. This is completely normal. The reason why I bring this up is because a lot of times people misunderstand. They think that if you have white privilege, that must mean that you're playing life on easy mode in every other way. And if you're a racial minority, it must mean that you're playing life on hard mode in every other way as well. 
So people get all mixed up about this and think that if they can point to one successful minority or one impoverished white person, that they have dismantled the concept of white privilege and proven it wrong. That's not what we're saying. White people have struggles too, and minority people have successes too. It's kind of a silly kind of one-dimensional view of privilege to see it that way, but that is the mistake that I see most often. Let me give you a few examples. Um, Oprah said a while back, maybe a few years ago, that she didn't have white privilege and all of these politicians got upset with her. This one politician, Todd Starn, says, I pray for the day that America becomes a nation where someone like Oprah will be able to become a billionaire. Todd Stearns thought that they were taking down Oprah and this epic tweet and proving that white privilege doesn't exist. But in reality, Todd Stearns was just showing that they really don't understand how privilege works. Oprah will never have white privilege because she's not white. However, Oprah has a lot of class privilege, probably more class privilege than all of us in this meeting combined times 100. Right? So she has a ton of class privilege, but she will never have white privilege. Um, just because you don't have white privilege doesn't mean you can't have class privilege. And Oprah shows us that. Um, here's another meme that's supposed to be destroying the liberals with their white privilege, right? This person uh, made this meme showing this homeless person and says, I still got my straight cisgender white male privilege. So I got that going for me, which is nice. First, I seriously doubt if the people who made this meme and took this person's photograph actually stopped to ask them if they were uh, cisgender or straight. But even assuming that those things are true, let's assume for a minute that those things are true. This person who is unhoused has very, 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 very little class privilege, but it is still true that they have white privilege. That is still true. Uh, I don't know how that white privilege operates in their lives, and I'm sure that most of us would not want to trade places with this person, because most of us know that being homeless is a terrible situation to live in. But maybe this person does receive some benefits. Maybe they're uh, more likely to get into the homeless shelter than somebody who's a minority. I don't know. But it is still true that no matter how little class privilege you have, it doesn't erase your white privilege. Uh, privileges don't operate that way. They don't erase each other or cancel each other out. Uh, but people misunderstand that all the time. That's the number one misunderstanding that I usually see. Another point that I would like to make is that privilege is invisible. Privilege is almost always invisible to the person who is privileged. Uh, most of us, if we don't have disabilities, don't wake up every day and say, wow, my life would be so much harder if I had a disability right now. We don't notice the things that we don't have to overcome, right? Because it's not an obstacle in our lives. Most of us, I'm assuming that everyone on this, um, in this meeting speaks English or you probably wouldn't be here. I could ask for a show of hands, but I probably already know the answer. I wonder how many of you thought sometime today, wow, my life would be so much harder right now if I didn't speak English. We don't notice our English privilege. Everyone just kind of accepts the life that we're given. And that's a normal way to be a human. It's normal to just accept the life that we're given. Um, very few people think about how lucky they are to be in America versus a lot of other places in the world that are a lot more difficult to live in. Or if you're not transgender, if you're cisgender, do you think regularly about how much harder your life would be if you're transgender? I know from experience in talking to people that most people don't. Privilege is invisible to the person who's privileged, of course. People who don't have that privilege notice every day the obstacles that they're having to overcome. So of course, white privilege is usually invisible to white people. Now, I know that some people try to feel guilty about that, and then there are people who will try to make you feel guilty about that. That's not really my perspective. This is just my opinion, and feel free to disagree with me. I don't think you should feel guilty about it. 
I do think that in gaming terms, you know how you can level a character up in a game? I think in gaming terms, we can each level ourselves up. We can become better people by considering our privilege, by thinking about the ways that we were lucky, or if you think about it that way, the ways that you were blessed. But I don't think that you should necessarily feel bad about yourself or think that you're a bad person if you haven't noticed your privilege. I think that it's just a normal human thing. <laughs> Again, that we just accept life as it's given to us. That's a completely normal human thing to do. I wanted to point out Peggy McIntosh. Uh, Peggy wrote a 1989 article called White Privilege, Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack. This is probably the most famous article written by a white person to other white people about trying to tell us hey, you have privilege and let's think about it. Peggy McIntosh realized in 1989 that she was familiar with the concept of white privilege, but she hadn't really considered how her life in concrete terms every day was different than other people's lives because she was white. So in this article, she imagines whiteness as an invisible backpack that white people can wear. And it's like filled with all these tools that they can pull out at any given moment to help them solve problems. And other people don't have those same tools. Now, I strongly encourage you to Google this and find it online if you haven't already read it. It's a really famous article. She wanted it to go viral and it did. I'll just read a few things to you so you can get a feel for the sorts of privileges she noticed. She said, most of the people on TV are my race. Of course, things have changed since 1989, TV has changed, but in 1989, that was absolutely true and it might still be somewhat true today. Um, skin colored band-aids match my skin. And she only pointed out band-aids, but that's true of everything. Stuff that's supposed to be nude or skin color will match my skin as a white person, but it won't match the skin of somebody who's darker. I've never been suspected of shoplifting in a store. Um, my kids can be terrible in public without me worrying that it will reflect badly on my race. I've heard from many of my minority students that they were told as kids by their parents, you better be good in the store or else everyone's going to think that Hispanics act bad or that Blacks act bad. I have never heard of a white parent ever saying that to their child. I can swear, talk with my mouth full, dress in secondhand clothes, drive recklessly, be late to a meeting and be loud in public, etc., without worrying that other people will think I do these things because of my race. That's true. White people usually don't worry about this. If I need legal or medical help, I can be sure my race won't work against me. Um, I can find someone who can cut my hair at any hair salon. If a cop pulls me over, I can be sure it's not because of my race. This is true. I'm still mad about a ticket I got years ago when I was going 34 and a 30. <laughs> I have not forgiven and forgotten that ticket. I'm still mad about it. But I have never once wondered, well, did that cop target me because I'm white? That just isn't something that usually crosses the minds of white people. So I encourage you to look up this article. You can easily find it. Um, and you might want to add to it. You might want to change things about it. It is a little bit old. I like this quote. Privilege isn't the presence of perks and benefits. It's the absence of obstacles and barriers. That's a lot harder to notice. If you have had a hard time recognizing your privileges, focus on what you don't have to go through. Let that fuel your empathy and action. And I think this sums it up perfectly. It's hard to notice the bad things that didn't happen to you today because of your privilege. It takes effort. You have to sit down and really think about it, really examine your life. It's not just going to be obvious to you just by everyday living, probably. So if you are a white person and you want to consider your white privilege, you're going to have to sit down and really think about it. But for all of us, whether we're white or a minority race, we can think about the privileges that we have, whatever privileges you have. So let me end by asking, how can you become more aware and how can I become more aware? I've been trying to incorporate these tips in my life. I have five 
tips for helping you become more aware and me. I don't mean to say it like you. I'm trying to do it too. The first one is examine your own privileges and disadvantages. You can do the same thing that Peggy McIntosh did. You can sit down with a piece of paper and a pencil and start writing out your own privileges in a purposeful way, not just kind of generally thinking, oh, I probably have privileges in my life, but really be conscientious about noticing the privileges that you have. Tip number two, listen to people without your privileges and believe them, empathize with them. We're going to have to listen to people who don't have our privileges if we're ever going to understand what life is like without our privileges. I know that the, a lot of times when people who have a privilege and people who don't have a privilege are talking to each other, the privileged person will try to tell the the less privileged person about how they must have done something wrong to cause this thing to happen or if they just change their life in some way. No, don't do that. Just listen. Just be there with that person and listen to their story. Try to understand what they're feeling. Empathize with them. Tip three, educate yourself. Here I'm thinking specifically of educational material like documentaries, textbooks, histories. I know that for me, I um, don't know very much about transgender history in the United States. Almost all I know is just the Stonewall riots, but I can't name like the main figures in transgender legal battles. I don't know very much about that history. So I've been trying to educate myself on that history purposely watching documentaries and things like that. Um, I also read a book recently from a person who had a severe disability. It was called Salt in My Soul. Um, and it was her journals and diaries put together after she passed away, unfortunately. It was amazing, but it gave me a really great insight into understanding the life of someone with a severe disability. I've been trying to do that very consciously to put like, find out educational, uh, seek out educational resources about uh, places where I have privilege and other people don't, if that makes sense. Number four, consume media from other perspectives. Um, and here I'm looking more at movies, TV, but especially social media. If you have an Instagram or a TikTok or a Facebook or whatever social media you have, are most of the people on your social media just like you? That's a question you can ask yourself. Maybe you make it a, a goal to follow 10 people on Instagram who live very different lives than you. Follow 10 Muslims in the United States. Uh, follow the TikTok of 10 Black people. And bear in mind, this is not so that you can go on their Instagram comments and argue with them. <laughs> Please don't be that person. That will defeat the purpose. Instead, you're following these people just to understand where they're coming from. You're just going to sit back and listen. You're not going to tell them why they're wrong or try to educate them in any way. Just sit back and listen to people who have... Uh, who don't have the privileges that you have. And my fifth tip is don't expect one minority to speak for all. Even if you are very close with someone who is lacking a privilege that you have, be aware of the fact that that is just one person. I am good friends with a black woman in her 40s who grew up in the area around Arkansas. And she says that she has never experienced any racial discrimination in her life. I'm also good friends with another black woman in her 40s who grew up in the area around Arkansas who had the KKK try to burn a cross in her front yard. Everyone's experiences are very, very different. So keep that in mind. I have heard from uh, minorities that on the one hand, if they say they experience racial discrimination, often conservatives will tell them that they're wrong and their experience wasn't what they thought it was and really whatever that experience was, wasn't actually racism at all. On the other hand, I've also heard minorities tell me that when they say they haven't experienced racism, liberals get mad at them then and say, oh no, yes you did. You don't know your own experience. Let me tell you about the times you've experienced racism. Y'all, don't be that person. <laughs> 
except that everyone's lives are different. One minority doesn't speak for all minorities and everyone has had a different experience and that's wonderful and beautiful. So hopefully this was helpful seeing how I talk about um, white privilege in a way that draws everyone in. I'll be looking forward to your questions. Thank you, Liz. Um, and now let's, uh, we're going to hear from Michael, and then we'll ask some questions. Oh, you're muted, Michael. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. Uh, here I am. Uh, I think these, uh, these presentations are going to overlap in an interesting way, and there might be a little bit of a contradiction, uh, because uh, uh, I heard the comment that uh, race is real, and it is socially real. Uh, however, uh, it is not biologically real. It's not scientifically real. And I think that one important element of race relations is that the definitions of racial categories change over time, and that actually includes whiteness. So let me let me start. I, I'm going to talk about Dallas. But first, I want to make observations about Texas as a whole, since what happens in Dallas actually doesn't stay in Dallas, as they say about Las Vegas. Sometime in this decade, the Latinx population is going to be the plurality, the largest demographic group. And that has definitely caused white panic amongst Anglos, the sense that they're going to lose their control over the culture and politics. And of course, the Democratic Party looks at this with anticipation. And in fact, the, there were some hopes going into 2020 that uh, maybe they'd reached a tipping point. There were some polls that indicated Biden was within, you know, a hair's breadth of maybe catching Trump, uh, that uh, maybe Democrats could capture the House of Representatives in the State House, and three decades of Republican rule would end. Uh, that proved to be disappointing. And if you've lived in Texas a long time, if you're a Democrat, you learn to be disappointed a lot of times. Um, the, uh, Biden got closer. Uh, his margin of loss was smaller than Hillary Clinton's in 2016, but no, but he lost and no uh, Republican House district flipped. And one, one group that they really had hopes for, the Democratic Party, was the Latinx community. And we have to note that uh, two thirds of the Latinx population, te Texas nationwide, vote for Democrats. However, here's a little thing that's my window into my topic that surprised some people. One of the most heavily Latinx parts of the state is South Texas. And you have two cities with enormous Latinx populations, Laredo and McAllen. And in those cities, Donald Trump's percentage of the vote jumped by 23% from 2016. And that's in spite of the fact that Trump spent five years demonizing immigrants generally, but particularly uh, immigrants from Mexico and from Latin America generally, and Central America specifically. Pundits are surprised, but the results are less surprising to anyone familiar with Dallas history, where the allure of whiteness, the allure of white identity has shaped city politics, its long history of inequality, economic inequality, racial oppression, since it was founded in 1841. Now let's note, the Republican Party is essentially a white party today. 47% of voters voted for Trump in 2020. 58% of white people did. But this is where racial categories get really complicated. In South Texas, where Democrats had expectations of much higher results than they had in previous years, 76% of the Latinx population identifies as white. That's, that's what they claim is our identity. Statewide, 62% of Latinx voters identify themselves as, as nationwide. And as one Texas Monthly article put it recently, Laredo, their 95% of the population is quote unquote Hispanic. That makes it the second most Latinx city in the country. At the same time, 95% also identify as white. So 
The confusion is understandable because, as I said, racial identities have no scientific basis. Uh, these are social constructs based on the economic and political realities of the moment. Uh, the idea of race only developed really at the era of colonization and the beginning of the slave trade. And the ideas of race and the racial categories justified Native American genocide and African slavery. You, you reduce these people to a category separate and less than human. There's no scientific definition of a white person any more than there is of a black and brown person. There's more genetic variation, uh, deviations in skin pigment, uh, hair texture, inherited disorders, etc., within racial categories than between racial categories. And here's a fact of history. Colonization, war, slavery have many terrible features. But there's one thing that it is also, all those phenomena are very effective, quote unquote, race mixers. Uh, people conquer, they, they colonize, they exploit, and they reproduce together, willingly or unwillingly. And so that, that's the scientific reality. The social reality is different. Historically, to be classified as non-white has resulted typically in assignment to low wage jobs, fewer opportunities for economic advancement, uh, exposure to institutional violence, uh, exposure to environmental racism and other terrible things. So material benefits attach to being considered white. But here's the thing a lot of people don't understand about racial categories. If racial categories were permanent, They'd, ha they'd lose power. You would have trouble getting the loyalty of people who lack economic privilege. And that's the thing. Uh, white definitions change over time. And that's the power of the allure. Because there are social privileges, psychological privileges, that come with white identity. As I put it in my book, being white requires not just a European ancestry, and relatively pale skin, it's also attitude. Whiteness rests on a central steadfast belief in racial differences, support for capitalism, the idea that competition and inequality are a product of nature, not, not social systems, a rejection of an activist government that seeks to redistribute power, and it's most clearly defined by what it isn't. It's defined by not being black, not being communal, and not being socialist. Those are the, those are the operational definitions that are often the most important. And I discovered it was really fascinating. In my research on the evolution of racial categories in Dallas, that the lure of whiteness often shatters potential alliances. Uh, between, for instance, the Jewish community and the African American community, the Latinx community and the African American community. It's racist and anti Semitic to assume that they have more of a burden to be supportive of civil rights than, than Gentile white people. But nevertheless, it is a tragedy that the whiteness becomes the wedge that often divides these groups. So, Jewish people, for instance, in Dallas, are never going to have the same hardships exactly as African Americans. They are going to face bullying, boycotts, and threats at the hands of the Ku Klux Klan, which is going to dominate the city of Dallas in the 1920s. They're not going to be able to join country clubs. For decades, they are pretty much excluded from elected public office. Latinx Dallasites are going to uh, be segregated like African Americans. Uh, and they're going to be not allowed in restaurants and parks. They're also going to, like the African American community, be profiled and face violence from the Dallas police. These forms of oppression, however, don't guarantee alliances. And to give an example, Dallas's Jewish population had a pretty ambivalent relationship with African Americans in the city. Sometimes Jewish leaders spoke out boldly for African American civil rights and sometimes they kept their distance, even as they sought a white identity. 
So for instance, this is an odd thing, <clears throat> how racialized the society was 80 years ago. I mean, it is now, but it's more extreme, of course, in the 1940s. So in the 1940s, the Dallas Department of Public Health separated residents in their classification system by a variety of categories we wouldn't see as racial categories today. Rabbi David Lefowitz at Temple Emanuel in Dallas sought to abolish one racial category in particular that the Department of Health used, and that was the category Hebrew. That was actually a category on city forms. Lefkowitz argued that Jews are a religious group, not a racial category. And he said the use of the word Hebrew is incorrect. Hebrew is a language. The designation Jewish is for religious category. And he says, of course, he writes to the department, the public health department, you are, of course, not trying to determine the religion of those you deter, uh, distribute the identification identification cards do. Otherwise, you'd put down Episcopalian, Baptist, Catholic, Methodist, etc. In this group, the word Jewish could be included, not in the former. And he's really excited when, in fact, U.S. immigration authorities, and this is a life or death matter, no longer considered uh, Jewish refugees racially different than Northern Europeans. And he, he uh, one of his assistants, the man's H.S. Linfield, is going to uh, uh, tell uh, uh, Lefkowitz, he's going to say, until recently, the government continued to regard incoming alien Jews as constituting a separate race. This new order has put an end to this practice. Jews must not be collected from the point of view that we are a race or ethnic group in the manner of the American races, meaning Native Americans, Negroes, Chinese, Indians, and so on, referring to people from India. This is a triumph. Now, this is an important issue because, of course, the classification of Jews as aliens helped keep them from coming into the country during the Holocaust and the years leading up to the Holocaust. But nevertheless, it does show that to Lefkowitz, Jews aren't, aren't uh, a racial group, but black people are. And the social construction of blackness is not something that's in his mind at that point. You, you really have uh, Jewish people in Dallas being caught betwixt and between, between their white, uh, you know, unquestionably white Gentile neighbors and the African-American community. And there is empathy, but it comes with a real cost. And so Jewish department store owners, people, the families now, Neiman Marcus, Sangers, et cetera, are going to enforce Jim Crow. African-Americans in the 1950s are gonna have to protest because Jewish-owned department stores don't allow black women or black men to try on clothes. If an African-American touches the clothes, they own them. They have to pay for them. Um, it's going to change, obviously. You know, there's going to, there are going to be leaders. Uh, and Lefkowitz's successor as a rabbi, Levi Olin, who uh, was born in Kiev in Russia. That was part of the Russian Empire at that point. He's going to grow up in New York. And he's going to be like a lot of rabbis in the South during the 1950s and 1960s, northern born who come to southern cities. And there's going to be a, a gulf between them and their southern congregations. Um, obviously, there are a number of Jewish people who are martyred during the civil rights movement, uh, who get murdered by the Klan, get murdered by mobs as they try to participate in voter registration drives, and so on. But we have to be aware, too, that while 97%, according to the 1961 poll, of Northern Jews support the Brown versus Board of Education decision, only 40%, or rather 40% of Southern Jews describe the decision as unfortunate. They're Jewish, but they're Southerners. And they're a lot like their Southern uh, uh, Gentile neighbors. And so we have Levi Olin making sermons on the radio in Dallas saying that uh, basically segregation is a sin, it's immoral. Uh, but when an African American tries to join the congregation, he's converted to Judaism. And his name is uh, 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 
uh, yeah, or, he, uh, rather he joins the uh, congregation. He's trying to get into the, uh, he's a professor at Bishop College, which was open in South Dallas then. And there was a reluctance on the part of the m membership to let him in. And Juanita Kraft is going to be a major African-American civil rights leader in Dallas. She's going to say there's kind of a mutual alienation. She says that they might have meetings, uh, Jewish people and black leaders might have meetings with each other. She, she had the sense that the Jewish community was less uh, fully supportive of the civil rights movement than, uh, than she expected, and less than the Catholic Church, for instance, she said, was more enthusiastically participating in the civil rights movement in Dallas. And she said part of the problem is that African Americans had stereotypical, stereotypical views of, black, of Jewish people. They, they would use phrases like, Jew down, meaning someone's going to cheat someone. Uh, that, that was common. And uh, she said that, I grew up thinking uh, as a, of a Jew as something, someone different from everyone else. So one of the interesting things I found in researching this complex relationship between the Jewish community in Dallas and African Americans is there were a lot of parallels with the relationship between the Latinx community and the African American community. Uh, there's a difference in that as a group, Latinx uh, Dallasites tended to have a lower economic status than many people in the Jewish community. Uh, there were working class Jewish people in the garment industry in Dallas, and they would very often, uh, the phrase I use, get Semitized. I think it's very common today to think of Jewish people as white. But for instance, when there's a garment strike in Dallas in the 1930s, um, an organizer, Meyer Perlstein, comes down from New York to help organize the striking workers. And the Dallas uh, Morning News has a headline that describes him, quote, as a Russian-born Jew. So they make him alien. They emphasize his Jewish identity. They play him as a, someone that's an outsider who's going to poison the community. You, your, your whiteness could be lost in the Jewish community if you're working class or fighting for the working class. Uh, lighter skinned Latinos who are more um, affluent could win what I would call conditional whiteness. But if you were darker skinned, Spanish was your primary language, you were manual labor, you were not going to get into what I call the white man's club and it is a white man's club that runs Dallas. And you see the two primary civil rights groups in Texas for Lat the Latinx community. Uh, LULAC and the American GI Forum, both formed in Texas, often keep their distance. They don't want to actually be too closely associated with the African American Civil Rights Movement. In fact, I've read letters from LULAC presidents where they say, you know, Texas uh, leaders in the LULAC movement, they say, we don't do the things that the black leaders do. We don't consider ourselves a civil rights movement for them. The term civil rights has been tainted because of its association with African-Americans. Um, you, you, nevertheless, the Latinx community has real problems with discrimination. There aren't laws on the books uh, statewide that define the Latinx community as non-white. There are individual school districts that by law segregate Latinx students, but that's not universal. Um, but nevertheless, in Dallas, uh, uh, Pancho Madrano, who is a big leader in the community, uh, and he's a labor leader, is going to talk about how Latinx kids couldn't go into Pike Park. How when they went to restaurants, they had to have the food served through uh, the window. How Latinx kids could only swim at the pool at Pike Park if they showed up on the day when they cleaned the pool. And they would get seven to nine in the morning, they'd swim, and then they'd have to get out and they'd have to clean everything up and then the pool would be drained and cleaned. Uh, that's the only time they were allowed in the park. Um, it's, it's uh, you know, it's really the, the, the tensions become real um, uh, and the leadership of the civil rights movement at this time really are seeking a status similar to Polish Americans, Italian Americans, other groups like that, where 
They had been seen as racial outsiders when they arrived in the late 19th century, early 20th century, but now they're seen as a white, quote-unquote, ethnic group. They're just a cultural variant of whiteness. And the Latinx leadership in this period seeks that kind of status. Um, you have uh, one LULAC council in the state expel a member because uh, that member married a black woman. They were kicked out. And the member of that chapter says an American mob would lynch him. We are not given the same opportunity to form a mob and come clean. Uh, yeah, which it's pretty shocking. Uh, the Latinx civil rights leaders fight like the Jewish community to eliminate Mexican as a racial category, which the state was using, the Department of Public Safety. Uh, they use a similar argument. They say Mexico is a country. We're not from Mexico. We're white. And they fight for that identity on the forms. And I even found, and I think I was the first person going to the Dallas Public Library to notice there was a collection of newspapers called the Dallas Americano, which was published by a man named Pedro Ochoa, who was bilingual, and he owned a chain of newspapers in Dallas. And his newspaper, he used the N-word to refer to black people. He had a slogan he printed in Spanish that said, segregation is liberty. And he says, why do we have such poor schools that are like black schools? We're white, we should have the same quality of education. He didn't disagree with the oppression of black students and their denial of uh, quality education. He wanted white privilege and he was very aggressively fighting for it. And you even, you know, you see this really re uh, more recently. That was in the 50s. Uh, there was a famous restaurant that just closed in Dallas called El Phoenix, downtown Dallas. Uh, there were rules, racial rules in El Phoenix, which was owned by a Mexican-American family. And Mexican-Americans had to sit in a separate place than white customers. And you had uh, no African-Americans allowed to dine there during its, uh, till the late 1960s, basically, that that, that barrier was uh, dismantled. So whiteness is a, an effective tool. I think this is the main point of it. White identity, whiteness is a, an effective tool for controlling dissent. It's a poison to community bullying, building. And it's not just the desire for the wages of whiteness, as W.B. Du Bois put it, improved income, better homes, and healthier status that motivates marginal people to seek white identity. It's also a matter of foundational anti-blackness, which is so deep in American culture. Uh, to share power genuinely with African Americans, economically, politically, would, in the minds of many white people, not only mean a catastrophic loss of white power, but whites have been led to, they've been convinced, they've been propagandized by social media, by not social media, by the mainstream media, by newspapers, by films, by TV shows, by newscasts that focus on black crime that that would result in a collapse of civilization. And that's definitely upon, that you see that in Tucker Carlson's show about great replacement, what will happen to American society. You will cease to be a civilized place if white people are not the dominant culture. This creates a great deal of apocalyptic fear. And I would just end with this note. If Dallas and the rest of Texas is ever to greet a new political order to create a space of racial equity, economic justice, a place free of environmental racism, uh, white supremacist police violence, fair courts, uh, honest opportunity for quality education. It can only happen if it abolishes whiteness, the concept of whiteness and the privileges that come with it. To remember the history of white identity, to remember the separate history of black identity, but to abolish the sense that whiteness refers to some set of superior attributes, and it's still in our minds today. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, very much for that. And um, if I could uh, follow that up with a question for you. So it's clear that whiteness and white supremacy culture, you know, doesn't only infect white people, it, it infects everyone. So, but I'm wondering, what do you see as some of the ways that 
um, the white people in power in Dallas or in Texas have uh, exacerbated or prevented intergroup coalitions from forming? Um, well, first of all, let me say there's a group we don't acknowledge that sometimes is affected by white supremacist ideas. And I think Kindy, you know, uh, writes about this, how to be an anti-racist. Um, one of the things that shocked me, I was reading an African-American newspaper uh, published in Dallas uh, for much of the 20th century called the Dallas Express. And it was a newspaper that consistently supported the civil rights movement. Uh, people who were, who were, had become marginalized in the black community because they were too radical, like Paul Robeson, the singer and actor were featured prominently when he was touring the Soviet Union, which is a dangerous thing to do in Dallas at any point, but particularly during the McCarthy era. And they backed him. They had ads in their newspaper, though, for products like skin bleach. And there was a slogan in the ad that said, enjoy the popularity that comes from a lighter complexion. So even African Americans, you know, they're not superhuman. They're going to absorb because it's in the oxygen. Right. Um, uh, I, I think that Dallasites, uh, Dallas leadership have, have been very successful at playing these groups off of each other. And you saw that particularly when the first generation of African-American and Mexican-American leaders began to really take power. And uh, there are some things I admire about John Wiley Price, but I remember him when he was upset about the uh, uh, Jaime Ramon, who was in charge of hiring at Parkland Hospital, and he was holding up signs saying, go back to old Mexico. Uh, uh, you have, a, there's been a success, and I think it's eroding. I think these groups are coming closer together. But Dallas has been very, uh, of course, they're brilliantly successful with the white working class for the most part, although there were Went white union members who resisted the power structure and realized they were being robbed by being conned by the idea of race. And that's true, 30s, 40s, 50s, those people are there, that uh, they've been very successful at uh, saying to poor whites, working class whites, you're hanging on a thread. And whatever little you have could vanish if your jobs are given to those people. If you know we have uh, something resembling affirmative action, if we have wealth distribution, if we have reparations, you're going to plummet to the bottom. If they're not on the bottom, you're on the bottom. And this other writer used the phrase "last place aversion." The 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 game often is to avoid last place socially, and I think that's a psychologically a terribly effective, awful thing that works. That zero sum game mentality. That, yes, uh, absolutely. Yeah, always, someone has to be in the bottom. Yeah, Liz, I had a question for you too. So we know that U.S. society has always been a pluralistic one, you know, from the first uh, colonization. Um, so why do you think that over you know hundreds of years that there hasn't been more recognition of um, you know the privileges that each group owns or doesn't own? Oh, wow. That's a, a big question that I'm not going to be able to answer <laughs> very quickly and easily. But uh, basically, the people who have power ensure that um, the social system that we're given seems natural. Um, we can see this a lot with male privilege. How many people today will argue that male privilege is natural and that it is just natural for women to submit to men and it's natural for men to be the leaders? Um, if you can make something seem natural, then it's a lot harder for the people at the bottom of society to fight against it. Um, so there's a lot of that going on. Basically, the people who have the privileges are the ones who control media, uh, who control the political rhetoric. Um, so the way that we think about society very often is it's natural. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I guess that's the short answer. The long answer would be going through examples for the past 400 years of how people in power have created the system to convince us that it's natural. Right. Instead of actually looking at it and analyzing it, just accepting it. And I just yes. had another question for both of you. So since we are a religious organization here, 
how does religion reinforce a white privilege? <laughs> well, uh, well, yeah, I, okay, if, I, if I could jump in real quickly, um, one of the themes I explore in my book is this prophetic framework for the Bible. A lot of pro Protestants and Dallas was one writer once described Dallas as the Athens of the apocalypse. A lot of doomsday preachers, you know, the Antichrist is coming, you know, the left behind books. And though that theology served several purposes. And one of them was that human society is doomed. That uh, we will we will have we're, we're heading towards Armageddon no matter what we do. And so the mission of the church is to save as many souls before the Antichrist takes over. And social reform is delusion that Satan's fooling you. He's distracting you from the business of saving souls. And uh, that's a very powerful force in Texas. And by the way, it's a point of view that says that Jewish people are very special and Arabs therefore are an impediment to the second coming. You, you don't even think a moment about what Palestinians deserve, uh, you know, you know any, anything about what's going on in the West Bank. But uh, a big element is to discourage social activism because uh, that's not, they say, that's not the mission of the church. And that's First Baptist in Dallas is, the technical term is dispensationalism. They're dispensationalist. A lot of the smaller uh, Protestant churches are in Dallas. There's a best-selling book of the last third of the 20th century. It was a book called The Late Great Planet Earth. It was written by someone who went to Dallas Theological Seminary. And that that attitude and the idea that if you're worried, you're a quote-unquote a social justice warrior, which is a, used as a term of contempt, that you're essentially deluded by Satan. You know, you're on, you're you're just distracting yourself. God's the one who's going to fix everything. I think that is real poison to racial justice, and is a form of white privilege that says we don't need to worry about civil rights or voting rights now because we we should worry about heaven. Liz, so I would uh, agree with everything you said, Michael, but I would expand on it and look at religion from the perspective of the last five thousand years or so. And uh, what anthropologists and sociologists have found, um, I think I can back this up with a lot of data. I know some sociologists disagree with me, so take this with a grain of salt that my perspective isn't always the most popular one. So other people who are very smart will disagree with me. But I think that the data suggests that religion basically doesn't ever or hardly ever tells you to believe anything. <laughs> Usually all religion does is it reflects the culture around it. Mm -hmm. And it ends up being a tool that people use to convince others of what they already wanted to believe. So you can see just here in the history of the United States, how in the South, when most white Southerners were pro-slavery in the early 1800s, they used Christianity to justify it. And now a hundred years later, reading the same Bibles with the same translations, uh, you know, or today, most white Southerners would not say that slavery is supported by the Bible. Um, so I would argue that the Bible doesn't tell you anything. <laughs> I have my own pet theory. This is my own theory, but I think that religions don't become global religions if they're very specific and what they tell people to believe, they have to be very general and they have to be the sort of generalizable ideas that people in lots of different times and places can all apply to their society and their culture. So all the global religions of the world are like this. They're very general and they don't really give very specific commandments that someone could agree or disagree with. That's how they become global religions. I think probably the very specific religions didn't become global religions. So global religions are malleable. They're like jello. You're able to pour them into the mold of whatever culture already exists. So if a culture is already white supremacist, religion is going to be used as a cudgel to reinforce white supremacy. And I think that if you had a culture that wasn't already white supremacist, then people wouldn't use religion in that way. 
you know, right now I can use the Bible to support the idea that women should be submissive or that men should submit to women. I can come up with reasons why the Bible says that. By the way, I'm not at all trying to say that that's really what the Bible says. Instead, what I'm arguing is, I think that every culture interprets religion through its own lens. So religion in the United States is interpreted through a white supremacist lens because the culture was white supremacist. If you imagine culture and religion as a train, the culture is the engine of the train and religion is just a train car being dragged along behind, in my opinion. Again, a lot of other smart sociologists disagree with me. So if you disagree with me, you're in a good company. <laughs> Liz, the only thing I would mildly disagree with you with is yeah. because I do think confirmation bias is a result. Yeah, that produces the result you're talking about. But I would say that denominations sometimes are very specific. Uh, I think that it is always tied to an economic and political agenda. And of course, yes. you know, the, the people at First Baptist are economically privileged. And, yes. And, yeah. And so it benefits white supremacy, shatters the working class, which makes it easier for the wealthy to rule. And so, yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that that's, I mean, the, the dynamic is there, though some denominations are much more specific than others. Yes, and I would agree with that. I think that's probably part of the explanation of why denominations will rise to prominence and then fade out. And nobody wants to believe that anymore. <laughs> it's because it doesn't actually support the economic system. Um, I am not a Marxist by any stretch. I always tell my students how I think Marx was wrong about almost everything. But I do think that Marx was right when he talked about the idea that religion is actually dominated by economic concerns the vast majority of the time, people are gonna do what's in their own economic best interest. So when slavery seems to be in their best economic interest, oh, we found slavery in the Bible. And then when slavery isn't in their own economic best interest, oh, slavery isn't in the Bible, what are you talking about? And it's important to note that African-Americans found the same Bible to be a book of liberation, the book of Exodus as an mm -hmm. anti-slavery tract, so. Yes. So I've got a question from uh, Frank um to michael uh what is the role if any of the dallas of the universities in dallas of any scholars who are questioning dominant white supremacy slash black inferiority uh dominant cultural acceptance in the present day you're referring to present day frank or oh you're muted no, frank. during the during the time that he was writing his book oh, okay. during the 50s right. and the 60s and uh including the black university bishop i think was in right. was around at that time I, I will say that the black public schools uh, were certainly interested in educating civil rights leaders. I mean, one of the things I found interesting is, you know, uh, uh, the uh, segregated Dallas high school was uh, had a curriculum for black history where they they read W.B. Du Bois. They they read uh, radical, you know, what well, whites would consider radical text and the 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 level of the writing that they were assigned to read was better than the white students were getting because white students were getting neo-confederate propaganda and frankly that's what was taught smu uh ut austin all the great universities in texas were uh re rehashing the lost cause mythology and then that was filtering down into the public schools i remember going through uh because I'm a masochist, I read more than 100 years of school textbooks used in Dallas. And I mean, it was shocking to read it now. Uh, world history textbooks saying nothing of importance happened in Africa, which is odd because Egypt was in Africa, right? And there were great kingdoms south of Egypt. And Egypt, of course, was a multiracial society, but they, they had they had bleached it. They turned it part of white civilization. Egypt became part of white civilization somehow. Um, the What's really uh, striking in the 1950s, there was a professor at SMU, John Beatty, who wrote what I think is the best selling, because it was read mainstream, published mainstream, and earliest Holocaust denial book. He wrote a book called Iron Curtain Over America, and he argued, this is 1951, six years after concentration camps were liberated, he said the Holocaust didn't happen. 
and he said people are called jews today aren't the jews of the uh the new, new testament and the old testament they have nothing to do with that group they're they're really asiatic russians is how he described them and he published it it went through several printings dallas women's club invited him to you know he said communists are taking over the university and in fact during the civil rights period the state government was constantly investigating major universities like the university of texas because they thought the the professors were communist they thought they were radicals and that created a pressure where most professors really sought to lay low they didn't want to stand out as advocates and the ones who did sometimes lost their jobs we had a red scare in texas that was extreme and uh um that that i think that suffocated the role of professors should have been to fight for liberation. We always assume that more educated people are less racist, but I have sadly found that that's often not the case. And in fact, the educated elites in Texas for much of the 20th century were advocates of eugenics, selective breeding. And by the way, I found pro-eugenics biology books being used in Texas in the 1930s and 1940s for elementary school kids. And so these racist ideas, the, the schools up to graduate school were conveyor belts of white supremacy. Thank you so much. That was, a, you, both of these presentations were great. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you I very got a question, got a question from Richard um, uh, towards, to Liz. Um, why, uh, can you relate why you, you, the UU Church has very little ethnic or racial diversity? A long pondered question. Yeah, I think that I would have to know the history of the UU better in order to give you a more specific answer. But what I can say is that, um, how do I describe this in English? It's like a picture in my head. <laughs> Uh, a lot of times cultural phenomenon is almost like a snowball rolling down a hill where it just kind of catches more and more and more and more snow. Um, I know that you might be familiar with chain migration that works that way, where one person might migrate to an area. And uh, like in the 1800s, all the Chinese immigrants to Mississippi, it started with just one person who went to Mississippi in the 1800s and started a general store. And then they write back to their friends and say, um, hey, it's pretty good here. I'm making a lot of money. And then their friends come and then they bring their friends and then they bring their relatives like that. A lot of times sociological phenomena happen that way. My guess is that the UU kind of started with white people and has just kind of continued with white people in exactly the same way. Obviously, it's not chain migration, but you know, if you've got a whole bunch of white people in your church and most white people are only friends with other white people, and then they invite their friends to church, well, then who's gonna end up at your church? Um, and a lot of uh, social phenomena are that way, um, where it's about social networks, um, and most people have their most dense social networks with other people who are of their same race. Now, I will say that there's a lot of sociological data on this. White people are the most um, isolated from other races. Minority races do tend to have more friends and family members and neighbors of who are white and other races. Uh, minorities tend to live in more multiracial worlds. Uh, when you're talking about their particular social world, but white people tend to live in a very segregated social world. So that's my guess without knowing the entire history of the UU. If somebody else knows the history of the UU and can answer more specifically, then someone else might have a very, Daniel's raising their hand. <laughs> well, yeah, there, there, there is a long history. Part of it is, you know, the, uh, the sort of Boston Brahmin uh, piece of the history. Um, and those kinds of cultural attributes, you know, um, statistically Unitarian Universalism is, is the most shocked religion. Lots of people find that they have a lot in common, but many people visit, but many people also leave, I think, because of um, the particular culture that is reflected, you know, which is white culture, essentially. And in, in, if, if I may suggest church. something else too, the history of the black church itself is important because you know, uh, those who were kidnapped and enslaved brought over, 
a seventy percent of them belonged to traditional African religions. Thirty percent were Muslim. For the longest time, the white enslavers couldn't care less about the religious belief of the people they had reduced the pop property. They didn't even think they necessarily had souls. Uh, they during the Great Awakening in the seventeen forties to you know later in the seventeen uh, hundreds, Second Great Awakening. You had circuit riders, Baptists, Methodists, who convinced white enslavers, well, you better introduce them to the gospel because you're responsible for their salvation. So they got dragged to white churches. And it was the phenomena you were talking about where these African-Americans in chains were being told by white preachers, God expects you to be an obedient slave. But they heard the gospel and they heard the Old Testament. They heard the ex They would go back to their... Uh, plantation uh, and African Americans informally would rise as preachers and they taught a liberation gospel. So African Americans as a group learned that white religion was about oppression, black church was about freedom. And the biblical characters are very important. Moses and Jesus, they're seen as freedom fighters. And I think uh, the attitude, you know, about, you know, being Christ centered is a, a, a important issue for a lot of African Americans. And also there's a wariness of stepping into an environment where white people will provide leadership and African Americans are not seeking that. Uh, you know, I mean, Martin Luther King basically said in uh, why we can't wait, he says, the white liberal is a greater enemy to us than than the Klansmen, because white people will sacrifice black interest for their interest. And, you know, they saw in the 60s, boy, as long as it was the South, you know, that we were integrating, that's great. But you go north and you're dealing with poverty. Uh, I don't know. You know, like they they suddenly got interested in Vietnam. There's, the black liberation struggle was not over yet and so there there's a fear of their needs not being centered in a society where black needs are never centered that you you would only replicate that experience i think it's a very hard uh thing to overcome uh and i'm not sure you know i'm not smart enough right now to improvise an answer to dismantle that but it's very i think it's very much tied to how important the black preacher is politically and spiritually. Yeah. And well, and you're, I'm sorry. No, I was just saying it would be hard for a white UU minister to replicate that role. Yeah. Mary, I see you. I'm just going to um, say one more thing um, that, uh, yeah, your point about anti blackness. I mean, the antidote to white supremacy culture is focusing on anti blackness and, um, and understanding how that works, because you're right, um, the needs of particularly Black people are not ever centered. So Mary Please. has had her hand up for a long time. <laughs> you're muted. Okay, I just wanted to make three observations. Uh, for one thing, I am Judge Mac Taylor's niece, and so I know an awful lot about school integration in Dallas. Uh, my uncle was the, the first federal judge who decided maybe that was the right way to go. Um, and I have been interested in watching the South Lake NBC broadcast about, you all may have seen that podcast, about what's going on in South Lake and to Professor Phillips' comment, the one word that fascinated me was some of the minorities, I think it was a Vietnamese man who said, he did not like all of this controversy going on about integration in South Lake because he wanted his children to assimilate. And I don't think we hear that word assimilate as much as we used to for trying to encourage people to be white or to identify and be like whites. And to Frank's question about integrating the universities, um, Michael Phillips mentioned the university uh, furor here about being communist. Remember, Frank, in the 50s and 60s, we had loyalty oaths. 
for our professors to have to sign. But SMU Perkins School of Theology integrated many years before the SMU faculty uh, integrated and almost before the University of Texas. It was the religious part of the university that had the faculty that integrated and encouraged the students to be integrated. And then my third point was, there's a very funny and wonderful book out called A Libertarian Walks Into a Bear. And if you're familiar with that, that book, it does point out something that I'm a native Dallasite. I grew up in Dallas. I, I understand when Dallas was the city of hate very well. I always said I had PTSD as a result of being in Dallas. But um, I was fascinated that the author in that book points out that some of the first slaves that were ever imported into the country came from Britain emptying their jails, not to Australia, but to the Puritans to be slaves for the Puritans in New England. So our history of making the other <laughs> into something lower or lesser or whatever you wanna call it uh, has been long and hard in this country. And the only other point, and thank you for letting me go on, but <laughs> the only other point I wanna make was school integration here was made compoundly more complicated because we had the tri-ethnic groups and blacks and Latinos were not considered to be the same group for integration purposes. Latinos were classified as white. And I think we're still fighting the residue of that problem ever since. Thank you. <laughs> that any other, the, any that, other, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say that happened in Houston too. Whites to avoid integrating hmm. black and white students would send Latinx students to black schools and vice versa. And yeah. so that dodge, and again, that's an example of divide and conquer that uh, the oh, Dallas yeah. certainly was masterful at, as opposed to massive resistance. You know, Dallas white supremacy, I think, mm -hmm. was more durable because it wasn't so blunt. It used softer forms of power, like, for instance, the manipulation of racial categories and integration. Uh, they were very good, at, and they were very good at co-opting leaders in the African American and Latinx community, and that was a problem too. And of course, uh, poor whites, the white working class, collaborating basically with their oppressors. Uh, yeah. That use of soft power was very effective in Dallas, in a way, some ways more so than what you saw in Birmingham or other places where yeah. it was more explicitly violent and. You know, it was low level violence. It's a police shooting here, police shooting there, rather than bombing a church. Well, and in the history of Dallas too, uh, there used to be uh, housing for servants in the park cities. And that housing began to be outlawed when Brown versus Board of Education was passed because that meant that the uh, children of those servants in Highland Park would go to the Highland Park School District, which was lily white, and letters went out to the heads of corporations in Dallas to say, if you live in the Highland Park School District and you have black residences in your uh, housing for the apartments over the uh, garages and that kind of thing, then uh, if they're of school age, they have to leave the park cities because Highland Park always paid to send those children, we call them those children, to Dallas public schools and we paid. They did not ever allow them in the Highland Park School District back in those days. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Mary. So we had hoped to have enough time to have breakout rooms where folks could exchange comments like Mary's, but as you can see, we have run out of time with our questions. But um, I hope you all noticed in the chat that Daniel posted a Facebook group where we hope to continue these conversations. Um, and there are ideas floating around about making it a regular um, event. So stay tuned for that. 
Um, let's give uh, Michael and Liz a round of applause. Thank oh, you so much Daniel. for joining us. Uh, yeah, for Daniel and Mary and um, Sarah for helping organize this as well. And uh, could I, I talk a little bit about the um, the Facebook group? Because I, I mentioned, you know, I had the idea there's a lot of discussion here. I think we want to move forward and there's interest in how we could change things going forward. There was a question about how do we do more to widen the circle in the North Texas besides just building awareness. I would be open to hosting a biweekly or monthly group continuing this discussion. And uh, I think what I will do is offer to take a poll in the Facebook group as to when and how often you want to meet. I'm not going to try and do that here. And I'm also answering the question about why our churches are so white. So uh, maybe I'll post that in Facebook also. Great. Because so I, I can get, get two on minutes of answer just on that. Yeah. How do we get on to the Facebook I've posted group? the link in chat. Oh, or if you just go you. to, uh, the group is called Entuk, a hyphen, Social Action and Justice. Mm -hmm. And I've already approved three people just, or <laughs> several people just tonight already. So, okay. any other closing words, Daniel? This is exciting. I'm glad to see the interest. And I think that hopefully this is just the start of doing more work. We also have talked about doing a follow-up group, um, a webinar, bringing in a person of color to give us a different perspective on the roots in North Texas. So just a, maybe a quick show of hands, who would be interested in attending that? Would you, would you come back for another group on that? And I see- Yes. I see some hands there. So we may be offering a follow-up group, someone like maybe Bob Ray Sanders to come and tell us a different part of the story. You know, it'd be interesting, would be uh, Michael Waters or Edwin okay. Robinson. Don't you please agree? Please send me, if you have names like that or links, uh, please send me uh, information so we, we don't lose it there. Because you could tell them to me right now, I promise to forget it. Yep, I will send that to you. <laughs> Thank you. I would like to do it too. Great. Good. So yeah. I did, one reason we uh, asked you to register was that we could have your email addresses. So I'll be sending uh, follow-up information out. And uh, that's one of the things I would send out. We are also looking at other topics for webinars based around economic uh, justice. So we're looking at um, uh, that then would reach into voter, uh, tackling voter suppression and other questions. And did we lose Jay? I saw Jay had a question there. Okay. I think Sherry has her hand up, but I'm, I'm conscious that it's after 8.30. I just had a really quick question for Liz, because uh, I was curious about a, a couple of things that were part of her presentation. Are you familiar with John Scalzi's single, a uh, straight white male lowest difficulty setting essay online? No, but that sounds amazing. <laughs> you should check it, it John Scalzi. Uh, Google John Scalzi, a straight white male, male, lowest difficulty setting. It is an extended metaphor using the gameplay thing. Um, I've read and, some of uh, John Scalzi, but I don't think I've read that. Yeah, so I, I, th I thought you might find it interesting. Thank you. I will definitely look it up. All right. Thank you. Very valuable information on the history. Thank you. Thanks for joining. All right. Thank Good you night. for being here. And thank you, Liz. Thank you all. It was thank wonderful. you all for being here. It was fun to everybody. talk to you. It was wonderful. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> that was wonderful.